Hi, I'm Ida Hagman. I'm here with Liz Whiteacre, who is the author of Hit the Ground, a collection of poems that tells the story of her experiences with spinal injury and how her life changed. She is also co-editor of the anthology Monday Coffee and Other Stories of Mothering Children with Special Needs. Whiteacre's poems have appeared in publications such as Word Gathering, Disability Studies Quarterly, and The Healing Muse. Formerly an associate professor at College of DuPage, Whitecker received the Vessel Fenstermaker Poetry Prize for Emerging Poets from Indiana University in 2008 and received the Inglis House Poetry Award in 2010. She currently teaches creative writing at Ball State University. So nice to have you here, Liz. Thank you, Ida. Um, why did you decide to tell your story about your injury uh, in poetry rather than prose? Well, I've always written narrative poetry, you know, po poems that tell small stories. Mm -hmm. And I started writing about my accident about 10 years after it happened. Mm. And so it was hard to remember exactly how things happen linearly, right? This event and this event and okay. this event. Um, I had some old drafts of poems from the, the time of the accident. I had all my doctor's records. I, I had notes. Um, and, and so I started using poem prompts and kind of diving into different moments of that experience and, and writing about them. And poetry has always been my favorite genre. Oh, okay. And so it seemed like a nice pairing. And eventually once I had written enough poems, I started to see that my story was coming out when I put all the puzzle pieces together. Okay. Um, what, uh, which was the first poem that you wrote? To in telling the story. Can you remember? Um, in the collection, towards the very beginning, um, there's a poem called Cold in a Paper Gown mm -hmm. about my experience in the emergency room. Right, right. I remember and that. that's one that I wrote during my MFA program when the accident happened. So okay. that was written very close okay. in proximity to that accident. Um, and then uh, Two Feet Shorter Than My Usual Height was another poem. Um, where I talk about my experience being in a wheelchair for the first time and how uh, a student in my program kind of viewed me differently or treated mm -hmm. me differently um, yeah. when, when she saw me at the mall. <laughs> right, I remember that poem very clearly and uh, it's a powerful poem. So um, those are probably of, in, in the collection that's still surviving from that time period, those are two that kind of made it through the 10 years with me okay. into the collection. All right. um, and why do you think that it w took 10 years for you to really you know, tell the whole story? I think part of it came from, at the time of the accident, putting all of my energy into rehabilitation and healing. Mm -hmm. um, also trying to get through my, my MFA program. I was at Southern Illinois University at the time and it happened over my, my first summer there. So I had one year in and I still had two years to go in the program. And so between the therapy and, and teaching and, and writing uh, my poems for classes, I, I just found it kind of difficult to talk about. I think at the time I didn't have enough time to process it sure. and, and really kind of think about what was happening to me and, and recognizing the different significant moments when I was just trying to make it through the day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you certainly have a, a great uh, memory for many wonderful details because it seems to me that the poems uh, are, are really, seem quite immediate. Um, so um, let's go ahead and, and have you read one of them and then we'll talk to, about that. Um, I, I'd like to hear um, Trash Can Unmoved. So I have it marked here. All right. Um, you could, yeah, if you want to tell us something about it before well, <laughs> you read it. I was going to say this, this poem. Um, I, I was a pretty independent person mm -hmm. um, in graduate school. When I went to Carbondale, I didn't know anybody walking in the door, and so I left my family. I left my boyfriend, who is now my husband, who I talk about in the book. Um, and I was really kind of on my own, and I, I got used to doing things for myself. And I learned pretty quickly after the accident happened 
that I wasn't going to be able to do that. I was going to have to rely on other people. And so to me, this poem kind of stems from that stubbornness. Okay. Also, the lack of preparation. <laughs> <laughs> when you're so used to your daily routine and you know, you get up and it's trash day, you take out the trash, you, you don't really think about like, oh, I can't do that anymore. And so the idea that I, I, I had not yet realized my limitations and they weren't kind of in the forefront of my mind and I wasn't really planning around things. So I didn't realize it could take, you know, 30 minutes to use the restroom when usually <laughs> it takes like five or 10. Okay, so this is called Trash Can Unmoved. At dawn, I wake alone with a start, crutch quietly with precision, like my first drive alone in the escort, the carpet foreboding as rush hour traffic, the furniture fierce as intersections, the tile sneaky as ice. Stepping so gingerly, my brace, sleep sweaty, does not move, my aluminum crutches lift up and up. We labor toward the kitchen. It takes 20 minutes, these 20 odd paces. All the bags shoved into the ugly can reek of decomposed chicken carcass, sanitary napkins, and other rank foodstuffs that cannot wait until the next collection. The can's belly is less than the width of the door, but how to move it? I can't heave it up anymore and march to the curb. It thuds when tapped at its base by a crutch's toe. It won't budge and pain shoots down my back, down my leg. I live alone in an alley in a shitty apartment. Two hours until pickup. Two hours to get this can to the curb. Kicking with foot, shoving with knee, sliding with chair and crutch. I curse and cry and pop Vicodin and eat a granola bar. Frustration floods my pores, the sweet sweat I remember from childhood when mom flipped flashcards for mathematics sitting parallel to me on the hard dining room chairs. The trash can finally looms on the threshold's lip, ready to stumble down the stairs. I duct tape the lid so it won't spill in flight. Crutch cocked like shotgun, it leaps toward the ugly can, launches it with furious chutzpah down the steps. And there the plastic can lay unbroken at the bottom. Muscle spasm seize my back. Spent and beaten, I'm a young woman who witnesses what random accident can do to flesh and bone, who is patched together with medications, elastic, Velcro, metal, wires, hope, who's incapable of domestic chores so simple as taking out the trash. Later that morning, this young woman crutches 40 minutes from her handicapped spot in the closest parking lot to work, thinking of the trash can lying lifeless on its smooth, unscuffed belly on the cracked sidewalk, like the dead kitten she'd found after school by the curb in front of her home. She feels her sweaty, chafed armpits moan, wipes them with paper towel after taking 30 minutes to pee. Then she smiles at coworkers, says, I'm fine, thanks for asking. I like that conclusion because I, it, it shows how, um, the poem shows us the reality behind the facade. And it reminded me that, um, you know, when I do ask people who I know have been struggling and they say, you know, I'm doing well, that maybe should probe a little more later, <laughs> um, that, that it's probably much more difficult than they're willing, willing to show. Um, well, um, could you talk a little bit about the, um, your writing process in relation to this poem? Or When I started writing about the accident, I was very fortunate to be on sabbatical from COD, and so I had time to write. And I really kind of got crazy with it. I, I tried all different kinds of styles. It was almost like being back in graduate school where it's a big smorgasbord, 
and you have the time and, and the luxury to be able to explore and experiment and rediscover and redefine your voice. Um, so I used a lot of prompts where I would kind of take a leap and then figure out, well, how, how can I connect this to accident? <laughs> how can I connect this to, to injury? Um, and some of the creative writing classes I took during that time, people kept, kept saying, really, another poem about the YMCA? <laughs> oh. <laughs> and so I, I, just, I just wrote as prolifically as I could and trying to, like you said, dig into all of the memories. And so this was, this was a memory that, that came back to me a lot mm -hmm. um, because more than once I would forget to plan ahead and ask a neighbor for help and then I'd be left with <laughs> yeah. well, some I, chore that had to be done. Yeah. And so um, I'm also a chronic lister. Um, a lot of times I'll get into poems by starting to list images or list words that I like sound together. Um, the, the list at the beginning, kind of comparing my very slow, painstaking <laughs> journey to the kitchen, I went through a lot of different um, metaphors and compared, well, what was it like, you know, that, that oh, I, I don't want anything to happen to set me off my course, and, and I finally came back to that, that feeling when, you know, you're 15 or 16 and you're, you're driving. And, and, and that winter weather, and there's that nervousness of anything could go wrong. And so once I found that, it became easier, and I kind of got into the poem with, with that list to set the, the tone, how anxious I was feeling. Mm -hmm. And one false move could, you know, set me back and be very painful. Yeah, I think that, you know, the one line that struck me was the tile sneaky as ice. <laughs> I think that's a very effective comparison to learning to drive. Um, and you know how how careful you have to be, and and how something. and so much going on, and so and and when the accident happened, I th it was like just a couple weeks before my twenty third birthday. Um, I had been doing a lot of training to become a lifeguard. I, you know, I had really gained a lot of strength. I was physically fit. I was, you know. I was on it. I you was I was guarding person. other people's lives <laughs> yeah. and and just, you know, just an instant, you know, I woke up one morning, bah, ready to take on the world and that night I'm just lying on my bed in the dark and I just I couldn't even get up and brush my teeth or or change my clothes from yeah. the day cuz it was too great an effort. And so, um, you know, trying to figure out a way to share those really abstract fears and emotions and sensations of pain with people in a concrete way, right? All, all drivers have kind of gone through that period or, or have right. had moments where they felt a little reckless because of the weather or, or, or concern. So that was another thing I tried to do as I was coming into this poem and a lot of poems is trying to find an anchor. Um, in this case, uh, the, my, my nemesis is a trash can, yeah. <laughs> everybody. Um, maybe not everybody, other people are maybe better, <laughs> better housekeepers than me. That used to be a long, much longer list of what was included in the trash Probably can. Probably just and enough. Some very wise friends let me know that. <laughs> they didn't want to hear more about much. that. Okay. Just keep the nastiest a, ones and move on. That's a good point and good advice for students. Sometimes, you know, you, you, you uh, have lots of details, but uh, lesses can be more. Yeah, kind of picking the most potent. Um, and those smells, I think people can relate to that. Just that, I, I wanted to stress that it was something I was desperate to get out of the house. Right. You know, I get, so that needs to be in there, <laughs> yeah, because you can't wait till next week when you can ask that friend. Right. Well, I can really relate to, um, uh, you know, the part where you're you're kicking it and with your foot, uh, shoving it with your knee, sliding with chair and crutch. I curse and cry and pop Vicodin and eat a granola bar. Well, I've never had a spinal injury, but you know, as I age, I find some tasks are are more difficult. Um, it, I I can relate to shoveling uh, deep snow where I go out and after 20 minutes, I'm like, well, I, I've got to go inside and you know <laughs> sit at the kitchen table and drink a cup of tea. I don't pop Vicodin, but I definitely take a break. So, um, and it was prescribed. It was oh, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm sure. I'm sure. I know. I know. I'm, you know. Um, 
you know, uh, I think this poem also is very effective in terms of, you know, how, in terms of time, you know, you mentioned time uh, a few times. I mean, the, the fact that it takes you 30 minutes in the, in the restroom um, really lets the reader understand how difficult this was and how much patience it would require. Um, I, want, I have a question about the last stanza and mm -hmm. why, uh, why did you switch to third person there? You know, throughout the poem you're talking about I and then you talk about this young woman. So what made you um, want to give us some? This is one of the few poems when I, I do it inside the poem and I, I kind of liked I kind of liked it, and I kept working with it and shared it with other. Oh, is this, do you think this is okay? Can I do this? Um, but trying to get some distance and perspective, um, there were moments now, like you're saying, just with general aging, or I threw my back out last week uh -oh. on the treadmill, and just reminding myself, oh yeah, it takes a lot longer to get from your car to the you know, to the to the yeah. workplace when you're when you're not walking well, um, but kind of that idea of perspective and distance and being able to recognize that in a way I was kind of a new person, kind of coming into adulthood at 16, starting to drive, getting all those new responsibilities, starting to prepare for independence when you leave the house. In a way, suddenly having this debilitating accident where my body changed so drastically in like a minute, less than a minute. Um, I didn't know if I would be able to walk again at that point. I uh, had a lot of really weird symptoms that doctors weren't quite sure what was going on at the beginning. Mm -hmm. I, uh, it ended up being a leaking spinal fluid from my disc mm -hmm. that was causing a lot of just like twitching and they just weren't sure it was it was interfering with the nerves if the it, unknown the layman's the way worst, you know. <laughs> funky stuff was going on yeah. <laughs> you shouldn't be leaking spinal fluid it's a bad thing yeah uh, so just a lot of weird things so at that time I I didn't know what was going on and you know I'm around people who don't know me well and I'm meeting new people who suddenly just know me as this you know, weird chick who has like wires dangling out of her shirt and big braces and crutches. And um, so my identity was changing so rapidly. And when I looked into the future, I didn't see it in the same way as I had the day before the accident because things were so uncertain. And so that shift to third person, I felt started to get at the idea that I have to view myself differently now and I, I, I have to plan ahead and I have to take care with my body while I'm healing and you know I, just, I have to make changes and some of those were physical scheduling wise and also just how I'm viewing myself. Mm -hmm. You know, at the end, I would do that all the time where I'd be like, yeah, I'm great. Yeah. <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> no, really, I'm fine. <laughs> because I wanted to believe it, but also because I didn't constantly want to be treated sure. differently, too. It, that, that can be exhausting. It's, it's wonderful to have unsolicited help, help um, but it can also be sometimes exhausting when every person you pass in the hall, oh, can I get, yeah. okay. Can I do that for you when you're just so fiercely trying to be in control of yourself? And so, I don't know if that fully answers oh, your it question. Oh, it doesn't. It, yes, it does. And I, and I would say too, you know, one thing that impressed me was the fact that you duct taped the lid. So I think already there <laughs> were very some, pragmatic. <laughs> there were some coping because I have to say I don't know. I can imagine I would have ended up not only with the garbage can going, but everything probably <laughs> spilling out. So, so you. I watched a lot of MacGyver <laughs> in my. Oh, okay. <laughs> so you were you were looking ahead. Well, let's go on to um, uh, to other people's pain. Okay. Yeah. Oh, you know, I had the opportunity to spend a lot of time sitting. Um, I try to look at that positively. <laughs> Ma, I think it. I think it a was a lot of positive. time in, in waiting rooms, and so I found myself eavesdropping a lot. Um, I have so many waiting room poems, and just I, and I like them very much. I have to say, <laughs> Thank you. That's yeah. so nice. I don't know what. The, what uh, <laughs> well, uh, I'm sure it's the way you the way you frame them and and tell the stories. And maybe, again, maybe because, you know, um, just having to spend some, you know, just having to go to the uh, routine appointments, you know, you see these little dramas. It's a, I, I guess it's a dramatic place. It, it is. And there are big differences, too. Like, 
um, the, the hospital where I would go for appointments or several times I had to go to the emergency room for different reasons. And that scene is totally different than the pain clinic where, I mean, you're surrounded by people who have been dealing with very serious issues for sometimes years. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, just the whole atmosphere is different or versus like the general practitioner versus the chiropractor versus the, you know, the five minutes you get with a neurosurgeon in, in yeah. Missouri and, and those sorts of things. And so I, I have a lot, a lot of um, more observation poems where I try to be more of a fly on the wall. Uh, not as many made it into this collection mm -hmm. since it's a chapbook. It's meant to be a shorter, uh, shorter story or shorter sample. Mm -hmm. Uh, but this one I felt was important. It inspired the, the uh, title for the chapbook. I have several poems where I fall down. <laughs> and then this story too really, to me, gets at the heart of it. And I didn't feel like I could tell it. I really, I, she really wanted to be called Mama Flo. That's one of the few names <laughs> that I kept. If she ever reads it, I hope she does someday. She's like, hey, that's me. Um, but I had to keep it in her voice, I felt, that, that that gossip, and here's this great truth that, you know, life changes so quickly, mm -hmm. um, especially with accident and injury. Uh, so this is called Other People's Pain. This nurse wants to be called Mama Flo, honest. She tells that to all the patients who each shift in their chairs. It seems she always has to get home and mow her yard. Every appointment I'm there, it rains. She laments wet weather and tells whoever will listen stories about other patients. The man who just wheeled out, she draws to a guy in a plaid shirt. He used to work with me over at the surgery center. He went on vacation last year, hunting with his brother, climbed up onto a deer stand, fell when he lost his grip. Paralyzed from the waist down now, the nicest boy. Nurse Flo shakes her head in disbelief. He told me once, after it happened, he couldn't believe life could change like that in the time it took to hit the ground. Okay. Um, one thing I wondered about this poem is, do you think um, sh that uh, Mama Flo is still telling these stories now with all the emphasis on privacy of patients? I don't know. I always <laughs> wonder, like, what would she say about me? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a good <laughs> that's question. That's a poem I haven't written yet. That, uh, that imagining of this, you know, young kid sitting there with all of my paraphernalia and, yeah. yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure every, probably everybody wondered about that because if she'll tell it about him, you know, she'll <laughs> tell it about me. Um, yeah, it really makes the point about how quickly uh, life can change and how quickly it changed for you. Um, oh, and I do want to say on Mama Flo's behalf, she was very charming. The, the gossip never felt oh, oh, no, vindictive or, yeah. or cruel in any way. I think, I think we can she was always just, I don't know, she was so friendly. And I think, you know, she bared witness to so much. Yeah. Um, you do. You're like, can you believe that? She like, sounds very sympathetic. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, talking about he was, you know, so nice and um, how she he he was, uh, you know, a, a co-worker of hers. Um, well, um, is there anything you would like to students to know about this poem or that would be helpful uh, to them? I really wrestled with the structure of this poem, actually. Okay, that's interesting. Um, because I, I actually if wrote down. If students care to check it out, <laughs> uh -huh. it's mostly dialogue, um, and I think sometimes dialogue can be challenging to structure in poetry. Um, knowing where to break the line in the middle of what somebody's trying to say can be a challenge. I ended up going with couplets in mm -hmm. this poem to try and slow people down. It's a very short poem, um, and also. To me, couplets, I, I don't know, I kind of think of pairings. Um, and in a way, Mama Flo to me, you know, she's, she's kind of trying to make connections with each of her patients or perceived mm -hmm. relationships at the, at the pain center. And so couplets seem kind of appropriate thematically just because she's, you know, she's trying to create these, these intimacies. And so to me, if I was going to get all, <laughs> couplets are more intimate or, or more romantic sometimes. Um, 
You see that in a lot of the formal poetry. And so I, it, it took me a while to, to finally settle on the, the, the line length and the, the couplets and whether or not to just write the whole thing in Mama Flo's voice and make it a persona poem. That was mm -hmm. something, okay. it, it kind of went through that phase. But then I thought, well, that's kind of weird in terms especially of a context with a larger collection where I'm speaking for myself mm -hmm. in so many of the moments. So I finally decided on kind of giving people a context that I'm sitting there and I'm overhearing her, you know, kind of share with everybody in the room this gossip about this person. Uh, so so I did, it, it did go through many different versions and drafts and well, and I think it's good for students to know, um, sometimes they will ask uh, their instructor, you know, should I do it this way or that? And I think what they have to do is just what you did. You try it and you see what happens and then you decide which works better. You know, and well, you and it's it so up. great with a word processor. It's so easy to do. Yeah. But I, I make sure I save drafts I was as I go. Say, <laughs> <laughs> version one, version two, version three. <laughs> so you can go back then and, and you have Yeah, to and kind of like com compare, well, does this look better? Does this look better? Um, but yeah, that was one that I struggled with. I knew what I wanted to say very quickly, but then how do, how do I deliver that message? Um, could you tell us uh, anything else about your editing and revising process that would be helpful to students? Um, I'm kind of a... Puker. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. I just, bah, I just get everything down on the page. Okay. So you, um, and then work from there. Yeah, like I, I don't recall specifically this poem because I've worked with it for so long, but you know, this might have started out three pages long, and I just try to get down everything that I can think of, and most of it gets cut it's or, or shifted into something else or you know, kind of playing around with different metaphors or similes or putting in my beloved lists and then taking them out and the description. And so poems start out really large and then I start worrying about the message I'm communicating. That's kind of first. And then how am I delivering that message? How am I going to guide people through that moment? Or what's the best way to present it? And then thinking kind of lyrically and so... Mm -hmm. And so, you, you know, you, you don't necessarily start out with the message, you start with the subject and, and you draft and then you think, or maybe, you know, well, what is my main point? And then you yeah. revise from there. Some, I usually at least try to start off with something I feel like there's a significance in that, mm -hmm, sure. like an idea that you keep coming back to or a moment in your life that you just can't quite get it out of your head or that person or so it's something that kind of nags at me and until I write about it I don't necessarily know its significance or the point mm -hmm. sometimes that's enough for me to figure it out and then I have to make the decision is it worth other people's time okay. <laughs> and then it might become a poem um, you know you've been able you you have an MFA right mm -hmm. and you've been able to study with uh, many many teachers so what was the most helpful advice you've received from from one of your teachers oh. Or some of the helpful advice. Read. Read. Okay. Um, and read contemporary stuff. Right. And so taking time with people who are writing right now. Okay. Like you can find them on Facebook and <laughs> making connections. So you you have a sense of the context you're writing in, and not necessarily who the competition is, but what are the conversations going on? And so if you want to send your work off to publication at some point, what kind of conversation are, are you are you joining so you have an awareness and it also introduces you to so many different opportunities um, you don't necessarily consider oh couplets unless you've seen other people doing couplets okay. and you, you have your opinions about well why do they do them how might I apply that strategy to my own work here um, well who are some of your favorite poets um, I could probably go on all day. Maybe I'll go with most influential poets. Okay. Is right. that okay? Sure. When I was in undergrad, I signed up for what I thought was a poetry literature class. And the first day I was asked to write down my, you know, my three favorite contemporary poets and you know, here here are the books you're going to be reading and this is what you're going to be expected to write and I thought, "Oh, <laughs> what have I done?" <laughs> 
I just, you know, got the wrong section number. And so it was pretty exciting that that was my introduction to my first poetry workshop and the first time I really ever wrote poetry. And in that class, I remember uh, reading Tony Hoagland's Donkey Gospel and Tad Kuzer's Weather Central. And those just blew my mind. <laughs> what did you like about them? I, I really enjoyed that they were narrative poets. Most of the, the stuff I had read in high school, uh, formal uh, poetry, um, not, a lot of, not a lot of contemporary poetry at all. Okay. Maybe a little bit of like William Carlos Williams, mm -hmm. who I really liked, um, some Whitman. But I, I hadn't, you know, p poems with like fortune cookies in them and <laughs> more, more contemporary <laughs> yeah uh, yeah so I really and, connected and poems with that them. told a story because that's what yes. a narrative poem is and then I uh, discovered Denise Duhamel and I really enjoy her work and then I got to work with Allison Joseph and Ronnie Jones mm -hmm. and Margot Schlipp at Southern Illinois University when I was studying and their work was really influential um, I enjoy them both as you know mentors and, and teachers but also just their work and seeing how they told stories th through their poems. Well, let, let's hear one more. Let's sit, let's go ahead a little bit in your story okay. and hear one more poem, um, the Make Lemonade. All right, it's going in order. This is helpful. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I guess I just got hooked into that. It was very hard to pick <laughs> what I wanted you to read. But. Uh, well, this one, again, stems from another doctor's visit. I really spend hours every week visiting various physicians and therapists and all sorts of stuff. Um, and so, like I said, I just had time to sit and think and observe and et cetera. And each doctor's office had its own personality, <laughs> its, its own atmosphere. And this is one that I, I really remember fondly. <coughs> Excuse me, this is called Make Lemonade. The lavender cardigan catches my attention. She wears it each time I visit, and its buttons pull the buttons holes until they squint. It's hard to look away because she rests a mauve clipboard on her pot belly and taps it with a hand tipped by purple nail polish. She calls patients' names clearly and is the brightest thing in this office dampened by beige and chronic pain. The fatigued furniture mirrors the patient's postures, yet this nurse flits like hummingbird from office to waiting room. Everyone looks up from magazines when she enters, a tinkerbell for Dr. Piernine. In a voice even brighter than her outfits, she talks with patience. She sweetens chit-chat with pleasantries from youth. A stitch in time, Mr. Smith. Really, Mrs. Jennings, the early bird does get its worm. Now, Barney, you know a penny saved is a penny earned. I play a game where I guess which turn of phrase she'll use before she slaps the swinging door with her palm leads a patient to an examination room. When it's my turn, my crutch catches the jam and I fall to the floor. My first thought isn't profane or apologetic. I find myself in a terrible tangle, wondering what wisdom or comfort this woman might give me. It takes the edge off my pain, this game. She doesn't help me to my feet right away. She squats, lavender sweater straining across her bosom, and sets her clipboard on the floor to hold open the door. Now, Elizabeth, she says, we must try to make lemonade, mustn't we? And I breathe in her lilac offer to pull me to my feet. Up we go. I settle on a padded table. I wait for Dr. Piernine, wait to be squeezed tightly, Wait to be sugared and transformed into something lovely, something to sip, something to desire. Um, I like the way the shorter lines at the end slow us down and let us know that, you know, something different is happening and that, that change is ahead. And, um, you know, it's 
uh, I think we see in your narrative that this is a, a moment of, of hope. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I also like, um, you call her a Tinkerbell, which is funny. <laughs> and I think some, you know, students, A, think poetry is only about certain topics, you know, um, flowers, and that, that it isn't necessarily funny. Um, and, you know, I think there's some humorous touches here in this poem, too, to, you know. And I, I guess it goes along with the way that um, this, this aide um, tries to brighten things, you know. She was all purple. <laughs> Everything was for yeah. just as many different shades as you can imagine. I even had to put in her lilac perfume was even like purple in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> From the flowers. And so she really did stand out because it could be really dreary and depressing. Yeah, we um, get that contrast. In waiting rooms or you're just... Oh, the beige waiting room. Everybody feels lousy and they're with people who love and support them, but they're tired and impatient from waiting, and dragging people around from appointment to appointment. And so she's somebody who really still sticks out in my mind yeah. as somebody who is, let's, let's do this. We're going to get through this. Yeah, I, I really like the characterization of her. You know, we can, we can see her and, um, you know, we get the sense of, of her personality. Um, and, and certainly it can't be easy for her dealing with people who are in pain and struggling all day, and yet, you know, she seems to have this uh, very positive, uh, uh, but also, you know, the humorous part, because, of course, we advise students, you know, don't, don't use cliches, and she has, <laughs> has one after another. So. I think that came from, actually, from a prompt where it said, you know, take a cliche and <laughs> make it new or make it different, oh, which I didn't do, but it did make me think of her. Well, you, yeah, and, you know, you, ha you, you, well, you you know, in some first cliches, we also say, you know, uh, do do have uh, profound truth in them too. You know that. Uh, um, so we, you know, we've got the um, uh, many of us who use the you know thought anyway about making lemonade. So, um, what advice do you have for students who want to get published? Be tenacious. Okay. <laughs> Number one. All right. Can you elaborate on that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, I used to teach a classical writing for publication here. Mm -hmm. um, so I would work with students for 16 weeks, you know, talking about the publication process. And I think that educating yourself about that process and understanding how publication works, especially for poetry, can be really empowering. Um, a lot of times when students first start to send out their work. I know it was the case with me um, in undergrad when I, you know, first started sending some stuff out. It's, it feels somewhat mysterious and personal. Um, and when you get a rejection back, it, oh, somebody didn't, doesn't like me, doesn't like my work. And once you educate yourself about how things work and you participate as an editor, like through Prairie Light Review, if you even take one term and serve as an editor on that board, you begin to realize that it's kind of a machine. And yes, it's very subjective and people are choosing the work that speaks to them, that they think is of high quality, et cetera. But your work might meet that criteria one day and with the same group of people, it might not meet that criteria the next or within the context I wrote a puppy dog poem and they just happen to have five puppy dog poems <laughs> that week that go across their deck desk and my puppy dog poem is you know not the best of the bunch or not the one that stands out or the one with the Labrador is the one that stands out because the editor had that right mm -hmm. and so little weird quirky things like that can sometimes be a factor sometimes it's because your work isn't ready um, and so Getting a sense of how, how the system works, understanding how to present yourself to uh, the, the editorial community, um, taking time to research and pick out journals that are appropriate. You would use yeah. the example in class, you have a great poem about your brother. And if you're sending it to, say, the, um, the feminist magazine, so to speak, if there aren't any threads of feminism <laughs> in that yeah. poem at all, automatically it's going to come back to you or you send your first poem out to the New Yorker which doesn't take you know unsolicited manuscripts it's it's yeah. an automatic no so becoming savvy about where to spend your effort 
and, and, and working with a community of writers who you know and trust who can help you sense when your work is ready, whether it's being in a classroom or starting your own writer's group or having just a close friend who you share work with that you trust that opinion. Spending some time as an editor, especially while you're in school, can be a fabulous education and kind of toughen your skin a little bit mm -hmm. and, and make it feel a little bit more business-like where, oh, okay, that one didn't get, oh, yay, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? You do a little happy dance and then, <laughs> oh, it's on to the next one. I need to get the next one off. So I think time, maturity helps with that, but also understanding, you know, the expectations mm -hmm. and how long it takes and how many su submissions a magazine might get and how many they're actually picking. You know, you might be throwing yourself into a pool of 3,000 people. You might be throwing yourself into a pool of 80. So there, there are a lot of resources at say, the library. Some resources, yeah. um, and uh, Jason Ertz would be a good person okay. to, to talk to if he's yeah. still here while you're <laughs> when you're watching this video or your, your, your English department contact. Uh, I would work with him. We would bring students into the library and show them different resources like uh, Marketplace and a bunch of the different uh, resources that the library has for students to flip through and hard copy. And then I really like uh, newpages.com. Okay. It's an online database. Uh, Duotrope is nice. Uh, Poets and Writers, that magazine, mm -hmm. um, the Association of Writers and Writing Programs, AWP, has a great kind of like a one ads type list where, where people pull out calls for submissions. Even just doing, you know, an internet search. You can even put in your topic. Once I started writing about accident and, mm -hmm. you know, those sorts of topics, I started to discover, well, there's this whole thing called disability literature and there, you know, there are publications for that. They focus on that and then I started to meet other writers and editors. I would look at where have they been published. I liked their work. I saw that they were being published in the same journal as me. Well maybe I could use that as like a secondary source to figure out other places that I could go and also submit my work. Uh, so yeah taking time to educate yourself. Use the, the resources that COD has for you. Right, and the librarians can be very helpful. Oh, incredibly great, helpful. Great resources. And, and the faculty, you know, yeah. they, they have lots of experience right. and they, they can't necessarily tell you exactly, you send this piece to this place and they'll definitely take it. But, but they can, you know, let students know about resources and where to get started. And then it's just patience and tenacity and saying, well, I believe in this poem and I, it may take a little bit more work, a little bit more revision, but I'm going to keep sending it out until I find that right moment, place, time, person that's going to pick it up and, and publish it. All right, well, what are you working on now? Oh, I, thanks for asking. <laughs> I just was at a book launch party on Saturday. <laughs> um, I have edited a collection with Lynn Jones. She's another professor at Ball State University. And on my very first day that I showed up for work at faculty meetings, she walked up to me and said, we have to talk. Um, she uh, has a group she started in Indianapolis, Indiana, that's a working group of uh, mothers whose children have disabilities. And they all, for maybe close to 10 years, they've gotten together and, and write and stuff. And when she was getting her PhD um, in she focused on uh, disability studies and she kind of used that group to do some research. So she was very interested in mother's writings. She knew that I had been writing about my own personal issues mm -hmm. and she said, well, I just, you're, we're going to be friends. She just knew. <laughs> <laughs> so we developed that friendship and she let me read her dissertation and I said, what are you doing with this? What are, mm -hmm. you can't just let it sit here. You know, these are incredible stories that these mothers are sharing. Um, I'm a mother myself now. Um, my daughter doesn't have a disability, but I could still pull so much from these other mother's stories. And I would see myself reflected in some of their choices or some of the things they wrestled with. And it was really powerful. They're very compelling stories because they you posted are. a couple of them online. And um, Yeah, we, we started a blog to, to be a companion to the book. So I've just, in the last year, I've just been totally immersed in other people's stories, <laughs> not my own. And, and it's been a really rewarding experience. I've worked, there are about 38 writers, um, a part of the project, all mothers. 
uh, writing uh, nonfiction essays, uh, graphic essays, and poetry, and some of them are artists, and they've included their work. And so just, you know, we, we got all of these submissions and then trying to p pick out what are the, the best representations of the themes that we were trying to explore in the book, and then working with the authors and editing and the order and all of those sorts of things. So it was a really new challenge, a really fun challenge. I got to write the introduction for the book, which was something new. <laughs> and was that satisfying? Did you enjoy that? I did, I did. Um, with the, the, the editing, um, it's a, it's a really nice way to participate in some of the the aspects of writing without having to generate new content for yourself. And so, you, you you're editing, you're you're trying to make sure that things structurally make sense. And because it's not your own work, you you really can kind of <laughs> <laughs> have the freedom to move things around. And some writers, I mean, there was nothing to do, and then other writers, you know, kind of requested like. I've never written before, this is my first piece, this is my first publication, would you help me with this? And so um, there were different kind of levels of, of aid um, during the editing process and so it was really rewarding to work with some of those writers and have them be like, oh, I hate my title and then, you know, make us say, oh, I love it now and so, so that was a lot of fun and then um, just starting to write nonfiction, I, I started a blog in companion to my book where I'm writing about just issues of healing and re-injury and aging and, and different things. And having to write prose that's nonfiction mm -hmm. and write it quickly and publicly share it quickly. <laughs> that's, that's a, a totally new, new <laughs> yeah. totally new experience. Much different than being able to be like, okay, I'm gonna work on this poem for 10 years before I... <laughs> before I send it out or share it with people. So those have been some challenges right now. And I'm, I'm still writing poems. And Liz, if people want to hear the rest of your story, because we really, those poems are sort of from the middle. If they want to hear the beginning and the end of this journey, where can they find your work? Well, thank you for asking. Um, if you go to Google or you go to Amazon, or Barnes and Noble, whatever your preference, if you just type in Liz Whiteacre, you'll you'll find it, it'll pop up. Um, you can also find my blog by typing in White Acre Hits the Ground and, and that'll link you to that work as well. All right, well thanks for that information and thanks for you spending uh, the time uh, to talk about your work. Thank you so much for having me, such a pleasure.